Welcome to this special edition by Union Solidarity International. We're absolutely delighted to be joined live from Austin today by Professor James K. Galbraith to talk about a number of the pertinent issues facing not only the US economy, but the wider world economy. Professor Galbraith, thank you for giving us some of your time today. My pleasure. Professor Galbraith, I'd like to kickstart the conversation by, of course, talking about the very topical issue of the shutdown and uh, allegedly being over as of the last 24 hours. Now, I know you've had very strong opinions on the looming debt battle and over the shutdown. Do you want to just give our international audience a flavour of where we are at the moment and why this crisis came to pass? Well, the crisis came to pass because the uh, extreme right wing in the uh, House of Representatives, which is a strong majority of the Republican Party, made a decision to use the debt ceiling uh, as a, uh, uh, a forcing measure to try and uh, oblige the administration to block the implementation of the, of the health care initiative. Uh, they failed in doing that. Uh, and it was an interesting exercise, I think, from the president's point of view in demonstrating that he, he simply refused uh, to compromise and negotiate. He could, in fact, prevail. Uh, and the particular dynamics of the Senate and of the House of Representatives and the balance of power in both bodies, I think, played an important role in ultimately uh, uh, his success on that. Uh, but that is the that is the fact of the matter. I think that the uh, this is being interpreted in the press in the United States as a uh, complete defeat uh, for the uh, Republican Party in the House of Representatives. Thanks for that response, Professor Galbraith. Now, I was reading earlier this week an article that you had done in Salon.com called The Coming Debt Battle that was in November of last year. And I know you were very eloquent and precise in your finger pointing at who was orchestrating this debt battle, in particular the proliferation of billionaire back front groups who have been trying to target Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. Could you just elaborate a little bit further on how big money is setting up political action groups in order to attack federal programs and to orchestrate crises that we have just seen over the last couple of weeks? Uh, yes, Washington is covered these days with uh, organizations which, as you rightly say, I, I describe them as front groups, uh, funded by uh, reactionary foundations, uh, in particular uh, the uh, foundation associated with the now very aging Secretary of Commerce and the Nixon administration, Peter Peterson, uh, whose objective has been to uh, uh, bring pressure to create a climate of um, panic and of, uh, let's say, forced action to cut back Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and other uh, federal social insurance programs. This has been a very, very long-term campaign. These groups are are very much uh, in the background of the decision by the Republicans to use uh, the debt ceiling, the concurrent resolution, and, the, uh, and then the debt ceiling as what they would call forcing mechanisms, as a way of trying to create a deadline and a sense of panic that would bring about uh, major concessions on these questions uh, before, uh, in advance of some dire or allegedly dire financial event. Uh, it's a very interesting phenomenon that, they, that, the, that the president did not give way on this occasion. It's nevertheless the case that uh, there are there is already in the budget a significant proposal that would curb Social Security benefits by changing the basis of the cost of living adjustments. Uh, and there is in the resolution of this uh, uh, crisis of the last, the last several days, a promise that there will be negotiations that will go on until December. Now, the fact that there 
may be negotiations does not mean that there will be an agreement, and I don't think there is another a plausible forcing mechanism if there isn't an agreement. So the general view, which I hope is correct, is that the negotiations will go nowhere, and that the president's proposal to uh, change the cost of living adjustments will also not pass. Uh, but uh, there are remain, in spite of the successful resolution of this crisis, significant dangers, and the front groups, of course, still there. Once again, thank you very much for your response. Now, I would like to just move the conversation slightly on, of course, to a directly related issue, which is wealth inequality in the United States in particular, and the, the stagnation in wages over a prolonged period of time. Now, we have seen over the last couple of months a plethora of campaigns often around fast food workers calling for a federal minimum wage of $15 per hour. And I know this is something you've been very vocal on as well in terms of the wealth disparity in the United States and it's only increasing. Could you just give us a, a viewpoint from your perspective on the crises of wages in the United States and how this could represent a major issue for labour unions to organizing campaign around? Uh, I, I spoke a couple of days ago on a street corner here in Austin to a press conference in support of the fast food workers here who are asking for, as you say, a $15 uh, minimum wage. Uh, if a significant increase in the minimum wage would make a substantial difference to a large swath of American workers uh, who are in relatively uh, small shop service industries and who are not presently uh, unionized and who have basically no uh, bargaining power in the labor market. Uh, it would also, as uh, one of the things that was uh, pointed out at this particular conference, was it would also reduce the burden of public assistance to those same workers who are uh, in a position now where in order to make ends meet they have to rely on a plethora of uh, taxpayer-funded programs. So this is a question of, of, in effect, of having the general taxpayer subsidize the labor costs of a uh, great many uh, rather low quality uh, 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 food providers, business, uh, fast food restaurants. So that's, that's the nature of that industry and uh, it would be a very good thing if a, a, um, a wage standard uh, both uh, required that they pay the, the uh, actual cost of their own labor, but also uh, improve the incomes and the living standards of the people who, who, uh, who work for them. That's absolutely fascinating because the same issue is happening within the United Kingdom that you might be aware of, where in actual fact, because of the low pay of employers, it is leading to tens of thousands of workers having to draw on entitlement programs that the state pays for. So in essence, the state is subsidizing bad employers and the same issue is happening across the Atlantic. So it's a, it's a very fascinating correlation between the United States and the UK, whereby the state is in actual fact subsidizing bad em employers. Now, I would like to t take your attention towards the crisis in the Eurozone. And if you recall, Professor Galbraith, in our previous conversation, we identified youth unemployment as perhaps the greatest issue facing Europe at the moment, where we see many countries such as Spain and Greece with youth unemployment over 50%. Could you just give our viewers and listeners a perspective and some of the policy prescriptions that you believe could address that if there was the political will, and what do we need to do in order to get that political will, Professor Galbraith? Uh, well, as you know, I'm associated with Yanis Varoufakis and with Stuart Holland uh, in a proposal, it's called the Modest Proposal, which is an effort to set out the major steps that would need to be taken and that could be taken under the existing framework of European, uh, the European Charter and Treaties. Um, and fundamentally, there are four things that need to be done. There needs to be a resolution of restructuring and uh, mutualization of the debts of at least some of the European member states so that they can be placed on a more sustainable basis. Uh, secondly, 
uh, the what we call the toxic link between national banks and national governments should be broken uh, on a case-by-case -case basis so that there is resolution actually of uh, the uh, uh, of the bankrupt banks rather than that there being essentially a black hole into which money is continually having to be poured. Thirdly, there needs to be an investment program which should be uh, led at least by the European Investment Bank as entity which has the technical capacity to do a good deal more than is presently being done. And fourthly, there needs to be a system of providing uh, for the uh, incomes for the basic needs of the populations of the countries in the European periphery, which is where these uh, massive problems of youth unemployment are, in fact, uh, to be found. Uh, and I think that uh, it is somewhat illusory, as many people have done, to say the youth unemployment problem can be addressed solely by education and training, and that is not going to work so long as jobs are not available. But if you stabilize the incomes of the populations, and not necessarily the young people, but older people, uh, then you will find that jobs are being created uh, which the younger people can fill. Uh, and that is, I think, the way this has to be, uh, ultimately has to be handled. Uh, but the, the underlying macroeconomic issue here is that the Eurozone has functioned uh, so far largely on the basis of uh, debt contracts, which are now uh, deeply unsustainable. Uh, and one has to move away from that system and create essentially stabilizing income flows that will permit the peripheral countries to have some, some breathing room and some, uh, some capacity for their populations uh, not to be forced into, um, uh, pop, not to be pauperized by, the, uh, by what's happening at the, uh, um, in, 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 their, in those countries. Professor Galbraith, I think that's a perfect point to end the conversation today and it only really leaves me to thank you on behalf of Union Solidarity International for your participation and part of our critical economic series. Thank you very much indeed. It's my pleasure. Always nice talking to you.